I'm Sip Down with Papa Who's Cracking His D, brought to your access video by Tub. It's titled The Disturbing World of Facebook Criminals. How are you a criminal on Facebook? On Facebook Marketplace? Are you trying to meet up with people, acting like you're going to sell them some, and then you kill them? I don't know. I'm about to find out though. Let's watch. From selling counterfeit items and the police kicking down the Facebook seller's store down on stream. <laughs> to live streaming borderline torture, to even luring victims with a Facebook marketplace listing and robbing them on the spot. Today, we talk about the dangerous world of Facebook. The new uh, Craigslist, I would never Hey guys, how are you doing? My name is Tuv, and I've seen some of you comment that like, why don't you talk to us anymore? Why don't you just, why don't you just get straight into the video? First of all, I, I thought that. you guys were annoyed when I talked to you at the beginning of my videos, so now it seems like it's the opposite. Unless it's not interesting. Guys, I just wanna let you guys know, I'm very happy, I'm healthy. Good, I love that for me. you, brother. Feel uh, it'll probably be the next upload, I really mean but that. I just want to let you guys know. Anyway, <laughs> let's head on to the actual video. The murder of Robert Godwin Sr. In one of the most bizarre trends to hit social media, a man named Steve Steffens committed what is now termed as a performance crime by killing an elderly man named the Robert Godwin Sr. <gasps> the video of the incident showed Steven Steffens opening fire and killing the 74-year-old who was just collecting aluminum cans on the road. This was in the Glenville area of Cleveland, specifically in East 93rd Street. And just so you know, the idea of a performance crime is that the perpetrator commits an act of violence as a way to please an audience and get their attention. There have been so many crimes, but the reason Stefan's case stands out is the dramatic twist where he turned the gun on himself afterwards. Oh. According to ABC News, Stefan's murdered Godwin Sr., recorded it, and uploaded the video to Facebook. The video then sparked so much outrage that the police in Cleveland got involved very quickly. They launched a countrywide manhunt for 30 seven year old Stephens, but while in he pursuit okay. and before they could get to him, he turned the gun on himself. Police had warned residents of Pennsylvania, New York, Indiana, and Michigan to particularly be on the lookout. Two parts of the crime disturbed most people who heard it. First, the video documenting the crime was up for at least two hours on Facebook until it eventually got flagged and taken down. Second, the victim, Robert Godwin, was picked at random. And I guess the residents of Glenville, Cleveland mm -hmm. felt any one of them could be next on okay. Stefan's list. In an interview with News 5 right after the incident, a neighbor said, until he's caught, we're not safe. We don't know where he's at. Steffens was a careers advisor and counselor helping young people find employment. It's noted that he also worked as a case manager at what? a children's mental health facility. Before the incident, he had posted two videos, noting that he had lost everything through his gambling problem and that he was at loggerheads with his girlfriend of three years. He had also been evicted from his apartment. Just after these videos detailing his troubles, he shot another video where he stops driving and gets out of the car while notifying the audience that, quote, I found me someone I'm about to kill. Obviously the video is horrendous, but it's just, it's so weird imagining someone with a gun in their hand, but also their phone in the other. It's like, just like, it, it, I don't even know. I can't say clout chasey, but it's, imagine like this, but with a gun on the other hand. And, and that was the video. Yeah, that's the video. It's like a first person. I mean, that's what it is. It's not like it. It's a first person video. After the murder, it took the police two days to catch up with him after workers at a fast food chain in the city of Erie, 100 miles away from Glenville, recognized him and alerted the police. Stephens had ordered a 20-piece McNugget and large fries, but the workers delayed his fries so they could call the police. As he tried to escape, of the murder. police performed a pit maneuver, which sent him spinning out of control. However, before he completely went off the road, he pulled out a pistol and turned the gun on himself. Four years later, after the incident, Mr. Godwin's daughter wrote a book, From Grief to Grace, just as a way to remember her father and deal with the loss. Mm -hmm. Eleni Topoludi's Tragic Facebook Date the story of Eleni's murder is one of deeply seated misogyny, love, xenophobia, and sheer stupidity. On a fateful night in November of 2018, a Greek student, Eleni Topoludi, went out on a date never to return and only to be found dead a day later. Her death caused uproar in Greece and beyond, as it turned out to be a brutal murder involving a high-level family in Greece. A week before her death, Eleni was messaged on Facebook by 19-year-old Alexander, who said he had developed an interest in her. Alexander, an Albanian living in Greece, had a fairly attractive profile given his well built physique and pictures of him running local marathons for charity. He seemed like a nice guy and this was also reflected in the That's way that it. he would compliment Eleni. They friended each other on Facebook and chatted back and forth about random things including Eleni's love for travel and her visiting the Rhodes Island in Greece until eventually setting a date. They had never had contact with each other before their Facebook encounter and to Eleni, this might have seemed just like a normal Facebook date. As agreed on November 27th of 2018, Alexander came to pick up Eleni from her apartment for the date set out for 10pm. They planned to eat out at a local kebab 
shop. However, as she got into the truck Alexander had come with, Elena realized there was another person in the truck that apparently was joining them in on the date. This third person was Manolis Kakuras, oh, a 20 year old Greek it. citizen. Manolis and Alexander were friends, and after a chit chat, they all set out for the date. Now, a key piece of background information that sets this story in perspective is that Manolis was the son of a local tycoon. He was from a family that owned a lot of restaurants and shops in Greece that held considerable power due to their wealth. As you will later realize, first off, just people out there, you going on a first date or second, third, fourth. Don't let them come pick you up. Don't even let them know where you live, where you lay your head at. Just meet them there. Just meet them there, okay, for a while. Until you get a good idea of their mental states. Just don't, don't, don't do it. This, this had a great effect on the trial of the case. During the date, Manolis suggested they all go to a family-owned fancy summer house in Lindos, Rhodes Island. They all set off for the house, but beforehand, Eleni messaged her friend to call and basically fake um, an excuse, like, yo, call me, get me out of the situation, dude. And that call was to be in an hour. So yeah, you could tell she was aware of the weird nature of the situation. At the house, they ate, hung out on the rooftop, and had their drinks. Everything was okay up to this point, and then it went sideways quickly. While on the roof, Alexander and Manolis request to have sex with Eleni. Based on their testimonies in court, Eleni politely refused and this is when the physical struggle began. They accosted her with one of them threatening her with a knife while the other grabbed her violently. Eventually, they overpowered her, took her to a room in the house and assaulted her physically and she lost consciousness at some point and then regained it after a while. Although beaten and bruised, she tried to fight back and told them that she would report this to the police. It was at this point that they decided to kill her. First, they tried strangling her, but they didn't succeed in that, so they ended up battering her face with an iron box. And even after that, she still didn't die, so they threw her off a cliff into a river. They drove out into a remote area, and that's when they threw her off the cliff. Surprisingly, the medical report shows that she didn't die from the fall. Rather, she drowned slowly in the shallow waters of the shore since she had been paralyzed by the fall and couldn't swim away from the water. Both men, after throwing her down a cliff, returned to the house, took her clothes, and threw them over a cliff near the house in hope that her clothes and body would be swept by the waters. Unfortunately for them, but fortunately for every sane human being, the tides were against them as the clothes mostly blew back to the cliffside and were later recovered by the police as evidence. Her body was discovered the following morning by two fishermen. Her face was so badly beaten it was impossible to recognize her and it took a rose tattoo on her ankle to identify her. Both men were arrested. However, during the trial period, Alexander got the harsher portrayal with the Manolis family attempting to influence outcomes in favor of their son. Manolis was painted in the media as an unwilling accomplice while Alexander received all the blame especially because he was Albanian. The case actually exposed the inherent xenophobia in Greece, where wow. even courts look less favorably at non-Greece residents. The Manolis family even allegedly hired a doctor to prescribe their son antidepressants to make him seem more weak and unstable. And on top of that, even tried petitioning the court to have an all-male jury. This particular what? jury request negatively portrayed Greece to the world, with activists pointing at this embedded misogyny. Eventually, on May 20th of 2022, both Manolis Kukuras and Alexander Luca were handed life imprisonment for murder and 15 Dude. years for the Facebook live torture Dude. in Chicago. Oh, Since man. Facebook added its live feature a couple years ago, there have been a range of bizarre live streams and one that is at the top of the list is the live broadcast of a man being tortured by two young men and two young women. This incident happened back in 2017 in Crystal Lake when an 18 year old was kidnapped, tied and placed in a room where he was tortured. The actual charges as reported by CNN included a hate crime, aggravated kidnapping, unlawful restraint, Why? and battery with a deadly weapon. The four perpetrators were identified as Tess Faye Cooper, so age 18, Brittany Covington, age 18, Jordan Hill, age 18, and Tanisha Covington, age 24. The oh two women, God, Brittany and Tanisha, hell? are sisters. The victim, an 18-year-old man with a mental disability, was reported missing earlier in the week, and as reported by the Chicago Tribune, it's confirmed that the four perpetrators were behind his disappearance. The parents said they dropped them off at a McDonald's in Schaumburg and never heard from him again until the appearance of the video online. It turns out that after he was dropped off, he was picked up by Jordan Hill in a stolen van, and they drove around for several days before ending up in Covington's apartments. Since the teens knew each other from school, this didn't what? seem odd until they got into a play fight that escalated into a torture crime. A neighbor heard the torture commotion and called 911. 
What made the crime even more disturbing is that they decided to share the whole thing on Facebook. The Facebook video was discovered after the teen had already been found. In the video, one of the young women quipped, y'all not even commenting on my shit, in reference to her audience not commenting on the live. Police believe that the young man was tied for about four to five hours. Also in the Facebook video, which lasted for about 30 minutes, he's seen cowering at the corner of the room with a terrified wide-eyed look. The video shows one of them cutting the victim's scalp with a knife, which I'm obviously not gonna show, while one other attacker randomly yells obscenities about Donald Trump and white people. The specific phrases were F Donald Trump and F white him. people. Police said the victim was, quote, very discombobulated, end quote, when they found him on the street. The attackers were all African-American, while the victim appears to be white. The oh. police did, however, refuse to officially... Okay, he's showing this photo. I thought this was the victim. This is... Uh, I don't know. Or maybe it's just bad quality. Because this looks like a brown man, but maybe not. Divulge the race of the victim. Rather, they said the motive for the attack was because the victim had special needs, rather than because of their race. Pretty odd considering they were saying frick white people while beating on him. CNN did, however, report that the court was considering hate crime charges against the victims. On December 8th of 2017, Brittany Covington pleaded guilty to the charges of committing a hate crime, intimidation, and aggravated battery. Additional charges, such as kidnapping, were dropped as part of her plea deal. Covington was sentenced to four years of probation and 200 hours of community service. On April 19th, 2018, Tanisha Covington pleaded guilty to the charges of committing a hate crime, intimidation, and an aggravated battery and was sentenced to three years in prison. On July 5th of 2018, Jordan Hill pleaded guilty to the charges of aggravated kidnapping and committing a hate crime and was sentenced to eight years in prison. On July 12th of 2018, Tess Faye Cooper pleaded guilty to a hate crime and aggravated kidnapping and was sentenced to seven years in prison. Oh my God, why would... The cold-blooded murders of Janelle Potter's friends. In this case of a Facebook feud that turned into a heinous crime, we explore how a young woman, Janelle Potter, ended up being at the center of one of the most gruesome murders instigated by social media. What exactly happened? Well, on January 31st, 2012, a couple, Billie Jean Hayworth and Billy Payne, were found dead by single gunshots to their faces. Payne also had his throat slashed. Billy was holding their infant, a seven-month-old boy who survived the whole ordeal. The couple had been in a feud with Janelle and her partner, Jamie Curd, and a mysterious figure, a man named Chris who allegedly worked for the CIA was involved. The feud started when Janelle claimed she was being bullied, harassed, and threatened with physical harm by someone posting on her Facebook page. She was convinced that the person behind the anonymous account was Billie Jean, and apparently because she was jealous of her looks. There was a suggested idea that Janelle had fallen in love with Billie Payne, but Payne's sister, Tracy Greenwell, who also happened to be Janelle's first friend in Mount City, Tennessee, said she didn't think such a romantic relationship existed. Actually, at the time of the murders, Janelle was involved with Jamie Curd. The feud was so bad that Janelle's parents were involved. They had been monitored during her Facebook page because they wanted to protect her. Being strict parents and Janelle having had trouble making friends since childhood, this was regular parenting for them. Janelle's mom, Barbara, had even tried to dissuade the anonymous commenters from bullying her daughter by pleading with them in the comment section. All this protection for Janelle was also because she was a type 1 diabetic and therefore sickly and living at home most of the time. She, however, was hiding her romantic relationship with Kurt from her parents. The police had gotten involved at some point in the feud when a rock-ridden Billie Jean and Billy Payne was found on the front lawn of Potter's family. After a while, all these parties unfriended each other on Facebook. A strange bit in the case was that Jamie Curd was texting a guy named Chris, who allegedly worked for the CIA, and told him that it was Curd's job to protect Janelle at all costs. It was later claimed by police that Janelle might have been the one behind the Chris persona because she was lonely and thus Facebook was her place to be, quote, someone she wasn't. Actually, an analysis of IP addresses of emails sent from Chris came from an IP address within Potter's home. After the murders, Janelle's dad was convicted, having confessed to the crime. The dad was named Marvin. The court found Marvin, Barbara, and Janelle guilty of first-degree murder and gave them life imprisonment. Marvin was convicted first in 2012, and Janelle and her mom got convicted in 2015. Another bizarre part is that detectives believe Janelle had used her Chris identity to goad her parents into committing the crime. Her dad, however, refuses this account of events. Surprisingly, in 2021, they appealed their trials with Marvin claiming that Jamie Curd was involved and specifically was the one that killed Billy Payne. Janelle and the mom plead innocence, citing the fact that they did not influence Marvin's decision to kill. I know that one was pretty complicated, but I hope showing the images on the screen helped you guys understand a little bit. But with that being said, let's head on to the next one. That was a lot. Using Facebook ads to lure and carjack people. In 2022, a pair of teenagers in New York confessed to the FBI that they were responsible for a series of robberies, carjackings, and kidnappings in the Bronx and Yonkers area of New York. Their confessions caught detectives by surprise due to the chilling trickery that was used to lure the victims. Instead of the old scam where perpetrators would pose as car buyers and steal from genuine sellers who show up to offer test drives, Deontay Fernandez, age 19, and Mark Francis, age 18, flipped the script. They posed on Facebook Marketplace as a car seller under the name Tagum and would rob people who 
came to buy the car. The New York Post reports that the duo used a red 2019 Hyundai Ionic to lure two particular targets. In the first instance, they met an unnamed victim on Highland Avenue in Yonkers on the evening of the 26th of September in 2022. The victim drove with a companion to the meeting place in a Honda and met the two teens in the company of a third accomplice. After the five got back in the test drive, one of the pretend sellers pulled a gun and forced the two victims back into the Hyundai car. Meanwhile, the accomplice took the victim's keys, cell phones, and wallets. The victims were later dumped at a busy intersection on Yonkers Avenue. In the second case, just a day later, Fernandez and Francis repeated the scam using the same red Hyundai car. They set the meeting place with a buyer at Sycamore Avenue. The duo still stole the wallets, phones, and car keys. They took off with one of the victims in the victim's 2021 Toyota RAV4 and left the Hyundai and one of the victims behind at Riverdale. The hostage was taken around New York City with two stops being made to withdraw a total of $6,000 from different banks. Meanwhile, the victim that was left behind at Riverdale alerted the police, and once Fernandez and Francis went back to the Bronx, where they had stashed the stolen Honda, the police were waiting for them. The two are facing life imprisonment if convicted. Whoa. Selling counterfeit goods on Facebook Live. Now, this one isn't gruesome, but it's just pretty stupid. It involves a couple that was caught by the police while selling counterfeit goods during a live session. To put this into perspective, you have to understand that Portugal has very strict laws against counterfeiting. Being part of the European Union, the laws are enforced as a way to protect the health of consumers and reduce financial losses by tax authorities and the companies making original products. The couple from Mirandela, Portugal, is seen in footage being caught red-handed selling illegal goods from their home. Meus amores, e o meu homem já vai dizer os números que tem. É? Pronto. Que albão, dona da lá. Então podem pedir que depois vejam os números, né? The woman in the video is seen showing off a pair of fake Adidas trainers, and in the background, one can see a collection of bags and other retail products. The video also shows the couple being arrested dramatically, with the police answering with a loud bang at the door, and shortly after, a man is seen lying on the floor, being handcuffed by the police. The police leader shared the footage on social media to remind citizens in the region that, quote, counterfeiting is a crime, end quote. Okay. All right, guys, that was it for this video. Okay, that was a good way to end the video. It got a little bit lighter because it was very dark. A lot of these situations were wild. People are just sick in the head. You got to be very careful out there, especially when you're trying to buy something from people or when you're trying to date, especially online. You meeting people on these apps and whatnot. Be very careful. It's a sick world. Y'all let me know what y'all think, though. Let me know what other videos you've been watching. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.